So, there are two different feasts that the Lord appointed to the children of Israel that have to do with harvesting. And we might wonder why there would be these two. Why not just at the end of the year, when you actually do the final harvest, what you've got that's left over after you're done eating everything, then give it to the Lord, right? Because shouldn't we take care of what we need first, and then extra can go that way. But no, the Lord has this other one. He says there's this other feast called the first fruits, the feast of first fruits. And that would be more the summer gleanings, right? Right as you're starting to get your fruit off of the, off of the plant. Um, I had a dog who actually would wait for strawberries to get ripe, and I planted all these strawberries one year, and I'd be waiting for them to get ripe, and Chloe would come steal them before I'd get them. Never got to have the first fruits of that harvest. Why are the firsts important? Why does it matter to the Lord that we give first? We could say, well, that means that we don't get to the end and don't have anything left over. That could be very much the case. So if we think, well, we'll give to the Lord at the end after I've already taken what I need, likely we'll not have anything left over. But it's something else that's actually more important. And we can think about this by thinking about our own children. And why do firsts matter for us about that? Like, why do we care about their first word? Aren't 99.9% .9 of children going to have a lot more words that come after that? And don't all of us end up speaking generally? Most of us do, right? What about that first step? Something that almost all of us have the capability of doing eventually. These things might seem weird to keep track of in little books that we go, my baby's first, this and that, right? We think of them as really important, and they are. But why? Have you ever stopped to wonder why we keep track of first so much? Or even as a child, why it's so important to be the first to do something? Like why I still remember that I was the first of my brothers to beat Super Mario Brothers 1? That's right. I was the youngest, but I did it first. Why do we keep track of records, the first person to climb Mount Everest? First seem important to us, but we might not necessarily know why. What if we think about those firsts not just as uh, an increment of learning that we go, okay, my baby took their first step, so that means everything is progressing as we need. That's good, right? That's a good thing to feel that way. You hear those first words, you see them look back at you, and, and you, they recognize you. Those first moments, really important. But it's more important about what they promise us. When we think about those first words, it's about the conversation we might in the future get to have with our children, the friendship that we hope to have as adults with them. When we think about those first steps, we might think about being able to show them the beauty of this world and exploring it with them. Every first holds a promise of something that's happening later. But we have to have a first, and we do celebrate it. What are the firsts for the Lord? And what promise do our firsts hold to him that he would say, you must not delay in offering your first fruits to the Lord? Why is that so important to him? What might be the firsts for us on a spiritual level? That's a good way to start. Maybe it's the first time you really step outside of a selfish viewpoint of your own to go, even though I really would prefer doing this, I'm going to choose to do that because the Lord wants me to. That's a reason to stop and celebrate the Lord. To go, whoa, I had a capability that perhaps before I didn't have. Because either we were blind that we needed to do something different, or we didn't know how to, and so we couldn't. So we've come to a new state where our learning has gotten us to a place where we can make a new decision. To put that into practical terms, maybe you've had a habit of 
foul language that just keeps coming out and you maybe you worked in a company that that was just normal so you just started throwing bad words around and it was habit and you didn't think much of it until you're hanging out with people who that's offensive to and they don't like being around you and you wonder why all these people don't like being around you much but it's because you got a potty mouth maybe at some point you learn that's why somebody might say you know i just really it makes my ears cringe when it's just one word after another like that now the proud person in the imagination of their hearts goes i don't care what you think <laughs> who cares whether it's offensive to you these are my words i get to say what i want When we think about this all in terms of progress, a lot of the times we want our faith to take these leaps and bounds that aren't actually possible. Very similar to wanting a loaf of bread without ever actually putting in the work in the field to produce the wheat, to then harvest it, to grind it down, to actually create the bread. Now, if we think about it, in the end, just like our passages were saying, this isn't any credit to one of us. There was a first person who, who made a loaf of bread at some point, and then everybody after that was not first. But when we go to make something like this, all of our capabilities, all of the materials that are there, all of the intelligence and how to do it, the science behind it, it all comes from God, doesn't it? If we think about it on the, the deepest level, all of that comes from God. And when we go to face these circumstances where we, we want a better life, we want something good, which is represented by our bread, but we don't necessarily want to put in the work, doesn't that put us in a position of being proud in the imagination of our hearts? My imagination says I should be able to just have bread without the work. The reality is all of the things that we actually need are provided. And we can be ungrateful and just go, I'm not going to put in the work. Who's going to feed me? Or we can magnify the Lord. We can take all of the pieces that we've noticed, of that he's, he's given to us, all the provisions he's made over the years, the bits of knowledge that we've gained over the years, and hopefully it accumulates to a point where we have a new ability. And then we can choose to use that ability to do something different. And here's the, uh, the next important part is it does take practice. Have you ever baked your first loaf of bread and it just didn't work out very well? The first might be important, but it's not necessarily the best product either. The reality is that every spiritual first holds a promise to the Lord too. Every time we do decide to take that next step in our own rebirth to change the, the negative parts about who we are and try to live into a more positive character, a more altruistic, caring character, that shows promise to the Lord that what he's planted in us is growing. We might think about the very first time we decide to not say something because we know it would be mean. Not because we're afraid of the consequences, but something comes up in our mind and we go, no, that's just a mean thought. I'm not going to say it. Celebrate it. Can we celebrate those moments, notice them and go, whoa, that's different. There are lots of these small ones that I think build up, but then there are also big ones. And uh, I shared a little bit of this in the video um, earlier this week promoting this service, but we might think about big parts of our life, big problems that exist, uh, big character defects that we notice in ourselves. Maybe it's a lack of humility. Maybe it's a problem with anger. 
Maybe it's lust that gets to us. Whatever that big thing that's just been lurking in the background and we haven't been able to really change it. Part of our realization in this story and the way that we're looking at this is there might be more work to be done before we can actually get to the result we want. Maybe we haven't cultivated our mind well enough to actually hold the seeds of truth that the Lord wants to make grow. Maybe we haven't done enough of the weeding to to find out why we should. So in college, I had an experience where I had been working on anger for a long time. For several years, from about 16, 17 years old, I was noticing how much my anger was just driving me insane. And for a long time, I didn't notice it because it was just a lot of people being mean to me. But when I started realizing that I had a a part in that, that my reactions mattered, for years I was trying to stop myself from reacting, but it just didn't work. And in a moment that I couldn't have controlled, I was playing a lacrosse match and this guy just cheap shot and I grabbed him, ripped him to the ground and I pulled his helmet off. And What stopped me in that moment? It wasn't me thinking about it. It was that the the wheat was ready to harvest. And in that moment, the Lord went, boom, stop it, Alan. Say you're sorry. That was a first. I'll tell you what, I've still dealt with anger since then. I still deal with frustrations. I still get angry. It doesn't make it go away. But I have a freedom to deal with it now. I have an ability to take those pieces that are there and to go, what's actually not true? What's a part of this chaff that I need to break away from the wheat so that I can separate those concepts that make me angry unrighteously and maybe focus on what's really a good and useful thing to do in this circumstance? Will my anger actually help? Probably never. One of the things that the Lord wants us to uh, know about this process is that he can't do it without us. Because otherwise, we would just consume. We would just go, give me more bread. And what kind of a life is it to just lay there and receive and do nothing of ourselves? In order to really give us a sense of part in this process, a sense of purpose, a sense of life in it, the Lord gives us materials. And then he allows us of our own free will, our own volition, to take those pieces as we wish, to put them together and create something. And if we think about any area of our life where we're still a mixed bag, is it at the point where we really just want to go, okay, I'm going to harvest this and make something and give it to somebody else. Well, if the wheat is still with the chaff, it's not a very tasty bit of bread. It's not going to bake up very well, is it? Some of this is, you know, patience with the process, right? Some of it's taking those little things that we've learned over time and going, that's the Lord working and it's going to be bigger magnifying what the Lord can do based on, maybe it's just a little thing now, but it could be huge. Noticing the anger issues in my own life over the years have built up to allow, allow me to do other things based on, I don't want to be angry anymore. And then other character defects were shown because I got angry. And then I could go, oh, if anger's in there, maybe that's wrong too. This whole process of the the feast of the first fruits is really trying to make us look at the whole process and think about all that goes into our first ability to do something new and spiritual. And the, the promise that the Lord sees in all of our first is the promise of our actual humanity. That we will be images and likenesses of him that we'll be able to become angels in heaven. And every spiritual first, that is every time we push away something that's wrong because it's 
against the Lord, or we choose to do something because we know it's good and caring, those are spiritual firsts that we really should stop and celebrate the Lord for. And here's what's beautiful about it. Every time we are grateful, it's gathering things together. It's gathering the good that's going to be used for the future in our life. When we focus on the gratitude, we aren't noticing all of the problems that get in the way. If we focus on the fact that, that God gave us wheat to plant, and he gave us ground to put it into, and he gave us sunlight, and he gave us rain, he gave us our hands, the ability to think of how can I make a tool to make this ground even better. He gave us the, the ability to think of how can I put these ingredients together in a way that they'll rise and make this lovely, good-smelling thing that fills us up and gives us energy to do what's good and useful. If we focus on all of the, the possibilities, the opportunities that are given to us, it can fill us with gratitude. And that's what this Feast of the first fruits is really about. What gets us to the point where something new exists. It exists within us, and now we know that that's our goal, is to produce that fruit, because it's so sweet. When we get to a new stage in our life, and we can really look back and go, I'm a different human being than I was before, that's a pretty powerful thing. And we can look at it and go, only the Lord could have done that. These are wonderful things to give thanks to the Lord, and even though it's just May 21st, it's not harvest, let's think about how we can give thanks to the Lord for the whole process of our harvest, not just what we receive at the end, but all of the challenges, the opportunities, and the provisions that God gives us so that we can end up having that beauty in the end, the beauty of really being a good human being. Amen. Please rise.